Welcome to episode five of Ask Paul Kirtley. In this episode, we're gonna talk about bears in Scandinavia. We're gonna talk about knives and what we do with them when we're traveling um, to where we're camping or hiking and uh, what the law is around that. We're gonna look at sharpening and how to learn sharpening. We're gonna look at where to park our car when we go hiking and how not to get bits in our boots. Welcome, welcome to episode five of Ask Paul Kirtley. Now, in the last few episodes, I've concentrated on questions from Twitter and Instagram, as well as some of the uh, spoken answers via SpeakPipe. Um, people are still sending me some email questions and I've got a bit of a backlog, so I'm gonna address as many of those today as I possibly can. I do think now, five episodes in, that the most efficient way is for people to send me tweets and Instagram messages because they're quite short, they're quite self-contained, and I can give relatively self-contained answers to them. But I appreciate that sometimes people need to send longer questions. I also appreciate that some people are not on Twitter or Instagram, and maybe they need to give a bit more background to the question as well. So I'll keep trying to get to the email questions, but they, they tend to take longer for me to get around to than the quick, short Twitter and Instagram questions. So if, you want, if you've got a quick, short question, send me a tweet, post an Instagram post, use the hashtag AskPaulKirtley and we will uh, get to those pretty quickly. Emails can take a little bit longer to get through, particularly if they're longer questions. Anyway, without further ado, first question. Tom asks, um, you've no doubt answered these questions historically, but if you can indulge me, please, it would be appreciated. Can you recommend a Mora and Oilstone combination, please, so that I can start and practice? I appreciate, as per an article you produce, that there is no point in getting a bells and whistles bespoke knife if you don't know what you're doing. Regarding lubrication of the Oilstone, which oil is best? Any suggestions would be greatly appreciated. Okay, good question, Tom. Um, it's, a, it's an oft asked question and it's certainly worth addressing. Um, I think you're referring to an article I wrote about sharpening on my blog. If not, there'll be a link to it in the show notes anyway. Um, if people have not seen that, it's, it's worth having a look at it. And it's, it's particularly talking about, there's, there's an article about how to sharpen the knife. And also I produced a YouTube video on how to get the bevel angle exactly right. I'll link to both of those in the show notes of this video. But to, to answer your general question, um, a Mora clipper, um, a Mora companion knife is absolutely fine. Something with a flat bevel, um, as per you know, many bushcraft shops, many bushcraft schools, as per many people use, a standard Mora 840 uh, companion is absolutely fine to get going with, and you can practice with that. Carbon steel um, is the one we typically go for, um, although the stainless ones you'll be able to practice with just as well. Sometimes stainless knives are a little bit harder to sharpen Go for, it. go for a, a carbon one if you can get hold of the carbon one. In terms of an oil stone, go down your local hardware store, DIY store, and seek out a combination oil stone. They're not very expensive these days um, because they're all uh, manufactured synthetically. They're not a quarried stone, like an Arkansas stone, and will be quite expensive, but a, a combination oil stone that's um, produced and sold for general uh, sharpening and DIY or hardware stores um, is not going to cost you very much. It's going to cost you, you know, maybe six, seven, eight, at most 10 pounds, depending on the quality of it. Similar price in dollars if you're working on the other side of the Atlantic. That is, uh, that's all you need. And then you'd need some oil. And I typically just use three in one oil. That works fine. You need to get quite a lot on the stone to start off with, because a lot of it will soak in. Um, and then you just need to make sure every time you use it, then you just put some more on so that you've got plenty of oil to, to work it. And, that, and that's all you need to do. And then follow the instructions in the article that I've written about um, sharpening and follow the instructions about getting the bevel angle correct. And then you should get a really good sharp knife. And once you're confident, Confident with that, you'll, you'll get a lot quicker at it in terms of producing a good, uh, sharp and sustainable edge. Once you're confident with that, if you want to then get a more expensive knife, then you're gonna have the confidence that you're not gonna ruin it um, by making the basic sharpening mistakes. And the basic sharpening mistakes are get, not 
maintaining that angle and you get a rounded bevel um, putting a secondary bevel on it by increasing the angle too much those are the sorts of things that you want to look out for but as I say if you look in those two things that I'll link in the show notes you'll get it right so watch those read those and let us know how you get on thanks for the question Tom Okay, Jeroen or Jeroen asks, I'm going to make a trip to Swedish Lapland. The area that I will be visiting is the wilderness between Sarek and Kiruna. So that's right up in the north, up, uh, up near the Arctic Circle and beyond, if those, those of you that don't know that. What precautions should I take for bears? Okay, well, I'm assuming you're going during a time of year that the bears will be active. Um, Clearly they hibernate. Um, there aren't many bears in that area. Um, in my experience, there are some. Um, I know there are some bears in that area, but it, you know, I know people up there, they're not a particular problem. Um, European brown bears are a lot less aggressive in terms of getting food than say the American brown bear or the, or the grizzly and um, they're also still hunted certainly in Sweden people will shoot bears um, not very often there's a very strict quota but they are not habituated to people and they're afraid of people so they will typically go in the opposite direction if they smell a person and you won't have a problem with them it's much less of an issue than North America where particularly in grizzly country where you've got the American brown bear or even in black bear country you really do have to take precautions all of the time because um, it's a serious issue so I would say don't worry about it too much you'll be fine okay next question okay this is a good one Andrew Buchanan Andrew asks much of the information regarding survival and wilderness pastimes includes suitability of different types of knife and I would like clarification of the legal position regarding carrying a knife in a public place. Does the fact that I am practicing outdoor survival skills, albeit on my own and in an entirely unofficial capacity, constitute sufficient legal excuse for carrying a knife? Okay, Andrew, that's an extremely pertinent and good question. It's one that I get asked a lot, and it's also an area that there's a lot of misunderstanding about and misinformation. There's a lot of ill-informed people um, posting comments on YouTube videos. I've had it um, on mine as well. Um, it was a, a video where I was showing how to create a large spark with a Swedish fire steel. Somebody commented on that, saying that the knife that I had in that video was illegal. That's complete and utter rubbish. Okay, um, certain knives are illegal. Flick in the UK, flick knives are illegal. Butterfly knives are illegal. Okay, but it's the type of knife that's illegal. Now, the legislation around um, what are commonly called bushcraft knives or survival knives, there is legislation around them, but the knives themselves, owning them and using them, is not illegal. So, people that say that are just wrong. Okay, that's the first thing. Okay, but there are some caveats and you're right, you talk about using them in a public place. Now, I am not a police officer and I'm not a lawyer and I'm not in a position to give you legal advice, but I will tell you what I do and what my understanding is. Now, having a bushcraft knife or a survival knife is no more illegal than owning a chisel or a screwdriver. Yeah? All of those could be used as weapons, let's not forget that. Um, and the legislation really is around them not being used as weapons. So if you're in your local supermarket um, and you've got screwdrivers on your belt, that is as much of a threat to anybody as if you've got a bushcraft knife on your belt. And that's what the legislation is meant to, to cover. So just the same as if you were a carpenter and you had chisels with you in a nightclub, that's not appropriate, nor is it appropriate to have um, a bushcraft knife. And it's those sorts of situations, they're extreme examples, but it's those sorts of situations where um, the, the law is aiming to cover. Now, walking down the street to a bus stop from your house with a bushcraft knife on your belt or a survival knife is inappropriate. You don't need to have it there and you would likely be stopped and, uh, and it would be confiscated at least and possibly um, you'd be prosecuted um, if the police found you, in my understanding. Um, similarly, if you've been canoeing and you've still got a rescue knife on you and you're driving in your car, if you're stopped by the police and you've got that on you, 
that is an issue. You don't need to have a rescue knife on you in the car. You need a rescue knife on you in the river when you're paddling, but now your canoe's on the roof and you're driving your car, you don't need a rescue knife. So it's about the context of where you are. The knife itself is not illegal, it's where you are. Now, the knives you are allowed to carry around with you all the time without any sort of reason is a folding, non-locking blade that's less than three inches long. So your typical kind of Swiss army knife blade that doesn't lock, you do not need to have a reason for carrying that around on your person at any point in time. Otherwise, you do need to have a reason. So if you are um, going camping and you've got a rucksack and your knife is in your rucksack and you're on the train and you're going camping in Scotland and you want the knife for your camping trip, that's absolutely fine. There's no issue with that. Now you mention um, official capacities. There is no official capacity for um, survival training and bushcraft training um, in, in the sense that um, I'm no more entitled as, a, as an instructor to have a knife in a public place than you are as a student of bushcraft. We're all students of bushcraft, we're all students of survival. Um, there is no official piece of paper that you can get to say, yes, you are more entitled to carry um, this thing with you than anybody else. So we've all got to abide by these rules. So what I do is when I'm traveling and when I'm driving, I make sure my tools, axes, saws, knives are in a bag in the boot of my car where they are not immediately accessible. They're not in the glove compartment, they're not in the side of, um, you know, in the compartment in the side of the door, um, they are out of reach. Similarly, if I'm in a, a public place, they are in the bottom of a bag, probably wrapped up in a carrier bag as well, so they're demonstrably not easily accessible. With a rucksack as well, they're in the side pocket with other things in there or they're down the inside of the main compartment, again, not accessible. So what's not acceptable is for you to be walking around with a knife on your belt when you don't need it. Now, when you get to your end destination and you get off the train and you put your rucksack on and you go off to go for a hike in the woods or a hike in the, in the, um, in the hills, if you want to have a knife, then it's arguably that's fine. You need it to, you want it to have um, to hand, and you can put it on on your belt. Um, now, whenever you speak to a, a police officer, it is largely down to their discretion in terms of how they interpret the law. So you may still have to have a conversation with somebody, but you don't want to have it out in the train. You don't want to have it out in, accessible in the car or a public place or a train station or. A, or a garage on the you know a service station on the way home just put it out of the way um, and then in terms of using it when you get to your end destination um, if you're on private land most things that you can do with a knife you actually need landowners permission to do you know starting cutting things um, that land belongs to somebody the trees and plants on that land belong to the landowner and you going around damaging them effectively um, is one interpretation with a cutting tool um, is illegal unless you've got landowner's permission. Um, and, that, and that's another issue. Um, so as long as, you, as long as you're sensible, as long as you can show that you're going on a camping trip or what have you, um, or on a bushcraft course, or you're heading to the airport to do, to do an overseas trip and it's in, your, it's in your hold luggage, of course, don't have it in your hand luggage. Um, all of those things, it's demonstrably there for a reason. You've got it for a pur purpose. You've got it uh, as part of your outdoor equipment. Um, it's there for part of your personal safety in terms of um, use in the outdoors so that you can do the things that you need to do to look after yourself. Um, all of that's demonstrable as long as it's not easily accessible either from the boot of your car, from your belt or from the side of your pack. As long as it's packed well away, I don't think you're, you're going to have an issue. And, and frankly, how, are they, how is somebody even going to know it's in your rucksack if it's not immediately obvious? So hopefully that helps. Um, those thoughts have always served me well. Um, that's the approach that I take. I've never had an issue. Um, and hopefully neither will you. So thanks for the question, good question. Okay, next question. This is from George, and George has been on a few courses with me, and his question is, um, 
When you're out backpacking in the UK on an overnight trip or longer, where do you leave your vehicle, assuming you've driven to the start location? I've often wondered if you ask permission at a pub or to leave it in a car park or use roadside car parks, etc. What tends to work for you knowing your car will be safe on your return? Yeah, it's a good, it's a good question, George. Um, it's not one I've been asked before, but um, that's one of the things I like about doing this series of, of videos is that I get asked things that I wouldn't put out as information necessarily. You know, I think in a certain way what's going to be useful to people, but people have always got questions in and amongst that. And this is a great format for me to be able to, to get bits of information out to people based on my experience that I would never probably put into a video unless somebody asked me the question. So thanks. Um, I do, if I'm backpacking in the UK, I do where I can try and get the train. Um, and that's partly an environmental issue. It's partly because I spend enough time driving anyway. And if I'm going on a trip, I quite like to get, you know, if I'm going to Scotland, I quite like getting on the train and going up to Scotland all the way up through the country, getting off Aviemore or Inverness or wherever I'm going to, and then you're already kind of chilled out when you get there and you can walk and then you can do a, you don't have to do a circular walk either. You can do an A to B walk, get up back on the train or the bus somewhere else and, and, and travel home. That said, I do use my car. I do do trips. Um, you, you're never going to be 100% sure, even on a day walk. I mean, you mentioned overnight trips, but you can park your car somewhere and it can be broken into during the day. Now, clearly there are some hot spots. You know, there are places where, that thieves target. They know people are going to be parked there to walk to a particular waterfall or walk to a particular beauty spot that takes them, you know, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour. And they know that the car is going to be left alone for that period of time. And those places are targeted. There are places I know of in the northeast of England where my parents live um, that are targeted by thieves. You try not to to park your cars in those places. Um, if you're parking your car more randomly because you're just setting off on a walk, it's less likely that thieves are going to be targeting it. But you can never be 100% sure that somebody's not going to break into it. But there are some things that you can do to sort of prevent that. Um, try not to leave any indication of how long you're going to be. You know, if, 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 if a thief drives past and they're an opportunist and they think, oh, well, that car um, is, is, is sort of deserted, they're more likely to maybe have a look at it than think, you know, you might be in the bushes or just around the corner. So certainly don't leave a notice in your windscreen saying, you know, my name is George, I've gone for a walk, I'll be back in four days. Um, if I'm not back, please call the police um, or the rescue services, which some people do. That's going to tell somebody that that's a sitting target between the dates that you've mentioned in your note. Don't do that. Leave word with somebody else. Phone them when you get back. Have a different system. Equally, try not to leave anything in the car that looks like it might be worth stealing. And that can be hard sometimes, you know, if you're, if you're getting changed and you've got other equipment in there as well, um, or you're doing a, a hiking trip as part of a longer trip where you've got other things in the car, but try and leave it looking like it's not worth the bother of breaking into your car as well. Um, so again, put things in the boot, make sure they're covered. Um, if you've got a cover in the boot, make sure it's on, put a rug over it, those sorts of things, so that it doesn't look like there's bags and equipment and useful things in there. Um, you know, don't leave phones or even cables that look like they might be leading to a, a phone or iPods or sat navs or anything like that. They're, it's all common sense, but just make it look not, that's not worth bothering with. Um, and that's the best advice I can give you. I, I don't think there's any more general advice. Yes, in certain circumstances, you might ask to park at a particular place, a pub car park or what have you, but that's a case by case basis. I've never had a problem, um, particularly parking in Scotland and Wales and places for several days. Um, uh, the only other thing I would say is try to park, you know, don't park next to a busy road where traffic's going to be going backwards and forwards. And again, an opportunist might go past one day, they go past the next day and they say, oh, that was there yesterday. And maybe it's worth us having a look at that. If you can park off the beaten track where people are not going to be passing very often, but equally are not going to be one of those hot spots, then that's probably the best advice I can give you. Um, hopefully that serves you well. Thanks for the question, George. All right, last question. 
Okay, this question comes from Graham Smith, and I like the way he frames it. Um, he said, probably the daftest question ever, um, but how do you stop or prevent small stones or rubbish getting inside your boots when on the trail or paths? I'm having to stop a couple of times to get rid of items that irritate the bottom of my feet. See, told you it was a tafty, Graham. Okay, Graham. Well, again, like George's question, um, that is not something I would ever think of putting into a video, but clearly it's an issue for you and it's likely to be an issue for other people. Um, so I don't know what type of footwear you're wearing, whether you're wearing low cut sort of trail shoes or whether you're wearing boots with a bit of ankle support or at least a higher ankle. Um, I tend to find the higher the boot, the less stuff that I get in them. Um, but you know, that's, that's one consideration. Um, I find walking through undergrowth and heather, if, even with ankle boots on, if they're relatively low, I'm going to get bits into my, my boot and stuck onto my socks. Um, and a higher leg boot is, is the better option, but they can be hot and sweaty and too heavy, um, particularly in summer months. So you want something else that can, that can bridge that gap. Um, a couple of things I find useful. Um, first off, uh, trousers with elasticated bottoms or bottoms that fasten with a bit of a draw. Um, so Fjallraven and Lundhags make trousers like that and many other companies do as well. And that just helps create a bit of a seal around your boot um, to stop things going into the top of your boot. You know, certainly walking through undergrowth. Heather is always my the, the bane of my life walking in Scotland, or it used to be. I always was always getting heather into my boots, walking through short heather and bits stuck into my socks. And I found that wearing trousers that sealed onto my boot was a good way of, of, of solving that. Another obvious um, solution, of course, are gaiters. Um, if you put gaiters on your boots and seal your leg, even if you're wearing shorts, you know, if you put gaiters on, that's going to stop a lot of stuff going into the top of your boots. But equally, they can be quite hot and sweaty as well. They stop moisture coming out the top of your boots. Um, and, it, and you can get hot, hotter, sweatier feet. And that in, in, in turn can cause your feet to be softer over a long period of time, you know, a day in hot weather wearing gaiters you're going to get very sweaty feet potentially that makes them soft that makes you more likely to get blisters so it's a it's a kind of trade-off and um, you can get quite short little gaiters that are cotton or poly cotton um, not so waterproof as the Gore-Tex gaiters but they help seal the gap between your boot and your trouser leg as well. I've used those in Africa, I've used those for walking in the Serengeti to stop ticks and other things getting in. Uh, you know, I wear short, short ankle boots and trousers, but there's gonna be a bit of a gap there sometimes. Bridge that gap with a, with a short gaiter. That's another option. Um, so that, they would be my recommendations really. Um, a higher leg boot in some, some circumstances, a gaiter to cover depending on the conditions, uh, a, a waterproof one in wet conditions, um, a, a, a shorter uh, poly cotton or cotton one in dry conditions, and um, also trousers that fasten over your boots, or even just have a little, some trousers, like the ones I'm wearing now, um, actually, and I won't show it because people are listening to this as well, they have a little hook at the front, which you can hook onto your laces, and um, which helps that stop them from riding up and helps keep that, uh, keep that seal. So any of those things I think will help. Um, let me know how you get on, and thanks for the question. Right, well that brings us to the end of episode five of Ask Paul Kirtley. Thanks for your questions, keep sending them in. Remember, Instagram, Twitter, using the hashtag Ask Paul Kirtley, and occasionally I'll get round to doing a slew of emails like I have done in this one. So thanks again for all your questions, and I will see you on episode six. Take care.